Well, uh, tonight we start in with our new devotional series on demons, and this is sort of a good piggyback uh, off of the series we just concluded on Satan, and I'm, I'm grateful to Sean Combs for uh, doing last week's devotional and wrapping up that series on Satan for me with us uh, unable to be here last week. But tonight we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll be in verse 1. And so we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and you can uh, turn there as we get started this evening. You know, some Christians, when they think about Satan or demons, they are very fearful of, of those two beings, if you want to uh, call it that. Uh, they're, they're fearful of the power that Satan has, they're fearful of the the influence that demons can uh, present or, or influence they have over people at times. But the Bible gives us a great reassurance. The Bible gives us um, a real assurance because of the fact that through Christ, we have power to defeat any foe. It doesn't matter who that enemy is. It doesn't matter what that enemy's objective is. It does not matter whether it is a spiritual being or whether it's a physical person that we have to uh, confront or deal with. We realize that uh, through what the Bible tells us, Philippians 4.13 uh, is a good example of that, that through the power and strength of Christ, we are able to accomplish anything. We are we're able to defeat any foe. Uh, but the Bible goes even further to talk about this particular topic. It tells us uh, in the Bible that Christ's death and his resurrection have already provided the ultimate victory over Satan. Now for us, we, you know, well not for us, but it's easy to look at the story of the Bible and Sunday we are looking at the crucifixion. And so this is very timely that these two sort of overlap. And with that being the case, we look at the crucifixion and it, it brings the mood or the temperament of the Christian faith down almost because the Lord and Savior of the universe has, or of mankind has died. He's died. He's being put into a grave. And it's almost like in the ebb and flow of Jesus' story, this is a big valley in the midst of that story. Jesus has died. Jesus has been defeated. Where actually Jesus' crucifixion is actually a high point. It's hard to imagine that because here he is. He's scourged. His back is filleted open, you know, so to speak, from the, uh, from the scourging of the cat of nine tails. He's had the crown of thorns on his head. He is, has been just physically abused just for hours. And here he is going to the cross, and we look at this and we think, how in the world can his death, a suffocating death, be a high point in the Christian faith? But that's exactly what it is. Because through his death and his eventual resurrection, which we'll be looking at on uh, Easter morning, his death and resurrection uh, do so much they do so much for the Christian faith in a wide uh, array of places. Because one thing it does is it, because of his death and his resurrection, we can receive salvation. We can have our sins forgiven. We can become children of the king because of that. But through that death and resurrection, another one of those high points that we see in the Christian faith because of Christ's death and resurrection is the fact that he provided us with an ultimate victory over Satan and over his demons. We see that that's what it is. That basically, even though Satan would have seen the death of Christ as this wonderful victory over, over God and a defeat of the Messiah and you know just a total victory for him. I've killed the Messiah. I have accomplished my goal I can't get any better. It can't get any better for me. That would be Satan's view of the death of Christ. But what we understand is that it was not, that's not the case. What it actually was, was the, the final nail in the coffin for Satan. It was the, it was the ultimate victory for, for us because that brought about our freedom from the sin that 
Satan uses against us because we're able to be free from it. We're able to be uh, victorious in this life because of Jesus' death and resurrection. We have victory over sin. We have victory over death because of our relationship with Christ. And when we read into the book of Revelation, which was written some uh, 60, 70 years after Jesus' death on the cross, we get a real good glimpse of how Satan truly is defeated. Because, you know, you know the old saying, I've read the end of the book, I know that we win, so to speak, when it comes to the Bible. Well, when you read the book of Revelation, when you study it, you get a real good glimpse of, of how Jesus uh, lays a hurting on Satan, so to speak, and how he defeats Satan, and how Satan is, is tossed into the lake of fire. And so Jesus' is dead. Even though we look at it and the disciples were dismayed, they were heartbroken because their friend, their teacher, their, their Lord had died. Yes, we understand that death brings a somber tone with it. But the death of Jesus is actually a high note in the Christian faith because it brings that victory over Satan and over every foe that Satan tries to bring against us. See, Christians really have nothing to fear when it comes to Satan, when it comes to this life. There's, there's really no reason for us to be fearful because if we're fearful, we've talked about this before, if we're fearful, that means we're not trusting God enough. Uh, because we're fearful that he's not going to provide. We're fearful for the circumstances we're in. If we're worried, we need to change it into worship. If we're fearful, we need to turn it into trust. And we need to trust God. But Christians have really have nothing to fear. But instead, they need to be wise in dealing with these very real enemies that Satan throws at us. Those demons that Satan uh, uses to... Uh, to tempt us to try and cause us to sin and to do all that he does. Now remember, I, and I'll use this example um, probably till I quit teaching the Bible, whenever that is, but you have to remember that, that there is the reality that we live in, there is the, the, the physical world that we, that's not good, uh, that, I've tried my best to get that thing to stay up here, now there I went and hit it. Uh, there is the physical world that we can touch, the things that we can pick up and feel and hand off and do all that. And then if we were to peel back the veil between this world and the spiritual realm, we would see, because of what the Bible tells us, we would see that in the spiritual realm, where heaven, ex where heaven is and where God's throne room is, we would know that there is a constant struggle, a constant battle between basically God and Satan. That Satan is constantly in a, uh, a mode of attack against God and against anything that God has created good and holy. Against God's creation, he does all he can to try and destroy it. And one of his best tools in that battle, in that head-on battle uh, that is millennia old, is our demons. And they are his right-hand men. They are his... Uh, best tool, so to speak. And there are plenty of people that if you talk to them today, they are enlightened. They are, it, as, as I've heard my dad put it before, it, educated beyond their capacity, so to speak. Uh, they are educated beyond their intelligence, I think is the way my dad puts it. Uh, there are some that are like that, and they will tell you that Satan is not real. He's a figment of imagination. He's myth. He is a long long-held boogeyman, so to speak. Uh, and the demons are the same thing, that they are not real, that they are just a, a, a story that people have developed over time to explain bad things and one thing and another. But that's because that is their view because they've not been educated on what the Bible says. And they don't have the faith that we do in what the Bible says being true. And that is that, as we see, tonight's devotional is about the fact that demons are real. And uh, we read about this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. This is, uh, there's really no other way to put it than for us to read this and, and move into the rest of the devotional. It says there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits 
and doctrines of demons. Okay, now let's... I try not to overcomplicate things when it comes to faith a lot of times because usually what you read and if you just look at it with some common sense, it's not too hard to figure out. People say, well, this isn't a sin anymore. This isn't a sin or that's not a sin. If the Bible calls it a sin, it's a sin. I hate to tell you, but the Bible doesn't change. Well, if we look at this set of scripture, this is the word of God. We believe it to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And through that, the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, said that the Holy Spirit has basically shared that in latter times, later times, and we probably live in those latter times, uh, I wouldn't say probably, I believe we do, people will depart from the faith. Whew. I could preach for a little while right there, but we'll, we'll keep going because we're not, we're not looking at that topic tonight. But then it says giving heed, part of the reason that they fall away from the faith, basically abandoning their faith, abandoning worship in the church, not being faithful and committed to the work of the church and to learning and growing in their own faith. We see that in plenty of churches around the world. It says that they will depart from the faith basically because they have given heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, those doctrines of demons are can be, I mean, it points out there point blank that there are demon, demons and deceiving spirits, basically one and the same. But what we see is that they fall into the uh, believing what the world says about sin and about other teachings, that it's, you know, sin isn't sin or whatever the case may be, that it's okay to do this or okay to do that because everybody else in the world, it seems like, is doing that. It's not the case, though. But what we see is that people are pulled away from their faith, not necessarily the church, because the church is where we worship, uh, but if you fall away from your faith, you're more than likely going to fall away in your church attendance, in your church participation, in your church activity as far as support and service and things like that your opportunity to learn and grow and things like that so we understand that that faith people are being pulled away from that because they're being deceived because they're they're believing doctrines that's another word for teachings they're 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 believing teaching they're they believe teachings that are not from the word of god they believe that uh, marriage is no longer a man and a woman. They believe that marriage is a woman and a woman or a man and a man. Or uh, You don't even have to be married. You just live together or whatever the case may be. There's lots of, uh, of doctrines, teachings that are strictly out of the Bible that people are believing the doctrines of the world or as they say here in 1 Timothy 4, doctrines of demons. You see, the Bible tells us that demons are a part of this whole hierarchy of evil that is headed up by Satan. That uh, that basically, here's something that if I've never, if you've never heard me teach this before, I heard this before, and I try to remember to teach this from time to time. But basically, the when you look at Satan and what Satan does, he is nothing more than a copycat. Satan duplicates; he's never the original. Okay, on anything that he does, he is a he's a duplicator. He is a copier. He is, he's a he's a Forger, he's a, a he makes counterfeits, so to speak. And so, what is he going to do when he leads a third of the angels in rebellion against God, and he's defeated and he's kicked out? Well, he's going to set himself up as the head honcho. Wait a minute, God's already the head honcho, and then he's going to have a hierarchy of demons. Wait a minute, what did God do with the angels? He has archangels, he has seraphim, he has cherubim. And he's got. Wait a minute, so Satan is just copying everything that God does. And that's, that's something that you can, uh, you can remember. But basically, he has this hierarchy. And like Satan, demons, though, are God-created. That's something that you have to remember. Because as we just mentioned, that those demons were at one time angels. Now they're considered fallen angels or demons, if you want to call them that. And basically, they were created by God to serve him, but they followed Satan in rebellion against God. And so that's something that we have to remember is that Satan doesn't, Satan is not a creator. He's a destroyer. He, and one of the things that he does in duplicating God's uh, hierarchy is he uses those that God created as well. Uh, 
They followed Satan out of heaven, so to speak, as he was tossed out because of his pride. But demons uh, are, and Satan are now both adversaries of God and people, uh, particularly Christians. Uh, but demons, uh, when you read about them in the scriptures, they are very real. And mo uh, several times, in particularly uh, well, in either the New or the Old Testament, they're referred to as unclean spirits, uh, which would make really good sense to us that those would be demons because those that would be clean, those that would not have uh, uh, followed Satan in rebellion against God would still be pure and holy, so to speak. But we see that reference in Luke chapter 4, uh, and really, and we see it in other places too, but really a the demons are um, only interested in destroying us. That's their, their, their objective is the same as Satan's. It's to cause havoc in our, in our lives, to draw us away from God, to try and destroy our faith. And uh, you know what? I'll be very honest with you. As a pastor, I see it happening all the time. People giving in to those uh, distractions and those temptations and, and allowing Satan and his demons to do a really good job in their life. But even though they are very real and very active, the devil and his demons are often blamed for many of the things for which they are not responsible. You know, a lot of times we'll hear people uh, blame things on Satan or blame things on uh, demons and uh, it had nothing to do with them uh, that it was not uh, you know their fault so to speak uh, some Christians tend to blame all kinds of sinful behavior or odd occurrences or even uh, or whatever they may face like that on evil spirits oh the devil made me do it yes uh, we, we've heard that phrase before. Uh, wasn't there, um, wasn't there, was it Flip Wilson was on TV before I was born? I hate to say that, but wasn't he, was he the one that would say the devil made me do it or something like that? Yeah, yeah so th basically this, and, and that's another one of those ways that those deceiving doctrines, those fault or the doctrines of demons gets into the world is when you have something like that. Somebody that says it off the cuff, says it in a, in a way, a humorous way, but now people believe that that's a, a cop out. They believe, oh, well, well I've misbehaved. I've, I've sent, well, the devil made me do it. You know, and now because it's been so long, you know, people younger than me don't know that reference, but they know the words. But they don't know where some of that has uh come into mainstream and so uh it but that's what we see is that they're oftentimes blamed for it i told you when we did the opening uh devotional on satan that my ipad did not record correctly that night and yeah yeah and i told and i told you i said i'm not one of those pastors that will blame every squawk from the soundboard or every pop in the system or you know, whatever on Satan, you know, it's the devil trying to disrupt our services. Now, could it be him? Yes, it very well could be. Are we going to know before it really matters? No, we're not. Uh, but the thing is, how do you explain my, my iPad never having messed up like that before and hasn't since? How do you explain that? Well, it's, it's an electronic device and they don't always work like they should. I can explain it pretty easily. Uh, but there would be some that would say, oh, that's the devil. He got in your iPad and the devil had, you know, all to do with that. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but it doesn't matter. The thing is, we can't go around blaming Satan for every, and his demons for every sin that we commit just because we've committed it. Even though Satan is a tempter and a liar and a deceiver and him and his demons main priority is to destroy us and to pull us away from our faith and to, to destroy our faith, even though that is their prime objective in, cre in their uh, world, what we have to understand is that much of what we deal with in this life, particularly in the sins that we commit, those sins are based more in our sinful nature, our sinful behavior, than it is Satan 
getting another gold star for being successful. Yes, he is going to tempt us. Yes, he is going to, uh, him and his demons are going to do all they can to take our focus off of God and put it on this earth. Yes, they're going to do everything that they can, but just because they do that and try that doesn't mean that every choice we make, notice how I said that, every choice we make that results in us sinning isn't Satan's fault. Ultimately, if this is a lesson that evidently they don't teach in school anymore. It's called responsibility uh, because you talk to, I, talk, I could talk to both of my boys about one thing. I didn't do it. Oh, it was my brother. Oh, no, I didn't do that. And, you know, wh- what do we see anymore under a certain age limit? I'm, I, we won't say ages, but under a certain age limit, people don't take responsibility anymore. It's always what? It's always whose fault? Somebody else's fault, exactly. It's all, oh, it ain't me. Oh, it has to be somebody else. Well, when we blame Satan, what are we doing? We're doing the exact same thing. Oh, it's Satan's fault that I fell into sin. Oh, it's Satan's fault that I did this, or it's his demon's fault. No, it, a lot of times we make stupid decisions. I can use that word in here because there ain't no kids in here tonight. Uh, but we make stupid decisions, we make poor decisions, and what happens? We find ourselves in sin. Well, whose fault is it? Yes, Satan may have been dangling the carrot, but he ain't the one that shoved it in our mouth. We're the one that bought the carrot, and we're the ones that fell into sin. So yes, yes, he gets a lot of credit for things he doesn't do, him and his demons, but are they out there enticing? Are they out there with that stick way out there in front of us holding that thing, that carrot out there as far as he possibly can to get us to fall and to move as far away from God as he can? Yes. Yes, he gets a little bit of credit for the sins that we commit, but the bulk of the load comes to us. It's our fault because we are the ones that give in. We're the ones that say the things we shouldn't say. We're the ones that do the things we shouldn't do. And ultimately, that, that falls on us. Because when we stand before Christ as Christians, before the judgment seat of Christ, he's not going to sit there and say, well, which one of the sins you committed are, are, are Satan's fault? All those things that you did good and bad with what I've given you, all those bad things you, or the things you didn't do that you should have done, all those bad things you did, how many of those are Satan's fault? How many of those are his demon's fault? No, he's going to look at us and say, you, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the time, the resources, the, the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience, the abilities, the, the, everything that you had? Satan ain't going to be in the picture. We can't pass the buck. We can't avoid responsibility we can't blame anybody else we have to take credit for what we do good and bad in this life and when we're standing there it's going to be us exposed to him just us and him and we have to realize that we can't blame uh, anyone else one thing that we understand though is that even though demons are real even though they are bent on destroying us and doing all they can to disrupt our faith and disrupt our relationship with God, we do have to remember that, uh, that this is a very real struggle. It is a very real struggle for us. And I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 6 that describes this, uh, this struggle. It says, in verse, this is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. You don't have to turn there, but it says this. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What is that? That's that spiritual realm, the heavenly places, and those are the spiritual host of wickedness. Sounds like a demon to me. And that's what Paul is warning us about there in Ephesians 6, that we should put on the whole armor of God, which is a whole other lesson and devotional series and things like that. But he tells us that we need to put that on so that we can stand against the wiles, the tricks of the devil. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It would be easy for us if we could see him coming. It would be easy for us if we could lay our hands on him, so to speak. And if we laid our hands on him, it's easy for us to 
uh, it would be easier for us to battle against him and to struggle against him. But like Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against something tangible that we can lay our hands on. He said, but instead against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark age against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly realms. And so he, he tells us, look, because we can't lay our hands on our enemy, we need to put on the whole armor of God so that we have a chance of defending ourselves against Satan and his demons. Have you ever seen, I don't know, I'm sure you've seen uh, movies and TV shows and one thing or another about people going into battle, let's say in medieval times. Uh, we think about the knights with the armor and they go into battle. Do you ever see somebody going out into battle in those movies or shows or anything? And he's going out there in a, basically the equivalent of a t-shirt and shorts? No. Why? Because he's going to get killed real quick. Why? Because he's not wearing the armor. And so Paul is telling us if we expect a battle, which we should because like tonight's devotional tells us, demons are real and their whole plan is to destroy us, then what should we do? We should be armed. We should be prepared. We should be ready for it. And the only way for us to do that is by putting on the whole armor of God. And so that's a devotional we'll look at another time. But we do have to remember that these uh, spiritual beings that are the best tools Satan has they are out to get us. And we, and we shouldn't be fearful, as we said at the beginning, because we are victorious through Christ's death and resurrection. But we do need to be wise in our dealings with them. And the best way for us to deal with them is to put on the whole armor of God and allow God to fight our battles for us. Because when we try to fight the battles ourselves, we're going to lose, and we're going to lose spectacularly. Because the, it will be horrible when we try to do it in and of ourselves. But when we allow God to work through us and for him to fight the battle for us, it's an easy thing for him. So that is tonight's devotional on demons. Next week, we're going to look at Mark 1 and see how demons are limited. Even though they have some power, they are limited. And the week after that, we're going to look at a text from 1 John chapter 3 that shows us that demons are defeated. And we see that there are, they're defeated and basically we just have to, again, trust in God and trust in His uh, provision there to uh, care for us.